Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We're so glad to be gathered with you for worship this morning. As we prepare for worship, will you please stand for prayer? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for gathering us together again this morning. Thank you for the gift of this place and these people. Thank you for your love and your constant care. We have come here this morning with one purpose, to worship you. But we realize that our hearts and our minds have been scattered to many different places this week. So before we utter one word, before we sing one note, please gather us home. Father, wrap your arms around us. Call your children back to you. 
fix our eyes once again on you and the incredible comfort and joy we find the gift of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. This time is yours, Father. We give it all to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
week of Advent. <clears throat> Today we will hear another passage of scripture which calls us to prepare our hearts for the celebration of the birth of the King Jesus and light the third Advent candle. <clears throat> Today's scripture reading is Isaiah 43, 1 through 3. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God. Indeed. Yeah. 
Well, Father, we are so grateful that you have gathered us here in this place this morning. We are so grateful for the Holy One, Emmanuel, the Savior of the world. Lord, there is absolutely no one like him. There is no one like you. There is no other reason for us to gather this morning, and there is no other reason for us to celebrate. And so, Father, this morning we ask that you would remove every other thing, every other distraction, every other thought, every other concern, every other joy, every other whatever it is that would cloud our minds and our hearts this morning and keep us from you and our focus entirely on you. And bring us as Bob prayed this morning, wrap your arms around us and, and, and welcome us back home this morning, Father, to focus completely on you. This time is yours. We have no one else to celebrate, no one else to give thanks to. No one else is holy like you. So, Father, we are here for you and you alone. Father, thank you for being here in our midst. Thank you for these people and thank you for this time of worship. We give it to you in Jesus' name. And the church cried out, Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. And welcome once again to Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We are so glad to be gathered for worship with you this morning. If you are here for Sunday school, make your way to the back of the sanctuary. Teachers are ready to join with you for Sunday school this morning. Let me... Um, Share just a few things that are happening in the life of the church with you. I cannot uh, believe what I'm about to say, but um, we are like eight days away from Christmas. Which means that it is uh, about to be this, maybe the single busiest time in the life of the church. Um, and there are many, many, many things uh, that we need to accomplish um, in the next 10 days or so. <laughs> uh, and so one of those things is we need to make sure that you are aware of um, the banking holidays and the way that those sort of play out for our giving structure this year. Normally, we would have two more um, uh, deposits that we could make in terms of receiving gifts. But the way that the bank holidays work out, next Sunday, December 24th, is your last opportunity to make a tithe offering special gift of any kind and have it be credited to your 2023 uh, donation statement, okay? The last 2023 uh, deposit to our bank account will be made on December 26th because of the bank holidays. So that means that next Sunday or potentially Monday, but Monday is Christmas, okay? So next Sunday is your last day to get a donation, tithe, or special offering gift to us, okay? Um, some people asked about online gifts. If you're using our online donation module, um, I'm not exactly sure about that, but I think anything that posts after the 26th will not be posted on your giving register until 2024, okay? Pam's saying no? Yep. Okay. So, so you would have till about the 27th, maybe the 28th on an online gift. But just for safekeeping, let's use the 27th as a cutoff for that as well. So you see what we're saying? It's just the banking holidays that kind of have got that uh, all out of whack this year. So we want to make sure that everything gets registered appropriate. So next Sunday is the cutoff 
for 2023 in-person gifts, okay? Um, and that also makes life better for our people who do the counting. And of course, for Pam, who has to then try to turn around and close the books, and we have to get the annual report ready for you for the annual meeting, um, which we're going to talk about in a moment. So please just be aware of that. Also, this evening uh, at 7 p.m. is our um, annual community candlelight Christmas gathering. It starts at 7. It's uh, titled, What is Christmas? Um, it is going to be a beautiful time of worship. We are so excited to be gathered together with you all. And hopefully, those friends, family, neighbors, I don't know, strangers you pick up on the way that you're bringing with you uh, to join in this event tonight. It is really going to be a great time of worship. Remember, this is a great uh, stress-free service for you to come, just sit, and be blessed. Um, and then afterwards, we're going to have homemade cookies and cocoa and coffee. Yes, coffee. Um, and we just hope that you will come and join together with us tonight at 7 o'clock. Next Sunday, don't forget, we have both 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. 7 p.m. will be our traditional candlelight Christmas Eve service. Uh, Roz will be on the organ bench for us, and uh, it will be a beautiful service as well. Um, we hope that you will join us. Remember the challenge that I gave to you for tonight and next Sunday. Let's see if maybe we could see what this building is like completely full again, right? Uh, standing room only. Uh, also a reminder that um, New Year's Eve, December 31st, uh, we do have worship at 10 a.m. as normal. Also happens to be a Sunday, so we will have our normal Sunday gathering at 10 a.m. I mentioned the annual meeting just a moment ago. Um, our annual meeting of the congregation will take place on Sunday, January 14th. Um, immediately following uh, our Sunday morning gathering, we will gather in the Beacon Room for a soup, salad, and bread luncheon. Um, there will be a whole buffet of soups for you to choose from. Um, everybody's going to get a small cup, so you can try a lot of different ones. Um, and then after that luncheon, uh, we will start the meeting. Um, if you have questions about the annual meeting, um, I'll be certainly glad to try to answer them. You can contact me about those. Um, everyone is welcome to attend the annual meeting. Uh, only those who are uh, members of the congregation are entitled a vote, but everyone is entitled a voice. Uh, in the meeting. So we'd love to have folks come and, uh, and join in that process, but only those who are members are entitled to vote on matters that will be presented to the congregation. Um, one last thing to share with you. As you came into worship today, you received our, uh, I think we called it winter uh, Easter um, events calendar. Um, and we're very excited to give that to you today. There's lots of great events that are going to be happening after we turn the page on the calendar to January. Um, and I want to point out just a couple of things that are going to come up quickly in January. Of course, we have the annual meeting, but uh, the last Saturday of January, we are going to bring back movie nights. Several of you have been asking for those. Um, and our first one is going to be the, uh, the Bridge to Terabithia. If you've never either read that book or seen that movie, it's a fun um, kind of fantasy, but not like, you know, super fantasy movie. Um, it's just a very interesting movie that asks two really incredible biblical questions that we will um, entertain after the movie as well. Um, that'll be uh, happening with a concession stand that'll have hot dogs and nachos and popcorn and all kinds of stuff. So put that on your calendar and take a look at all of the other fun things that are in there. Uh, snow tubing at Villa Olivia is back this year, so we hope you'll join us for that. Pizza party at Moretti's after the snow tubing, so that'll be fun. Um, lots of fun things coming up in the life of the church in 2024. So we hope that you're excited. We hope that you're excited to bring some friends to join in the life of the church. It really is a great time to be around CFCC, and we're so glad that you are here. Jeannie, anything else? But you said no, and then you said the only thing, so there is something. <laughs> <laughs> the office hours, yes. Don't forget that our office hours change uh, beginning this Friday. 
So we have normal office, normal office hours this week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 9 to noon. But then beginning this Friday, December 22nd, all the way until Wednesday, January 3rd, uh, the office will be closed. If you need any pastoral care in that time, take a look at your bulletin. My cell phone number is in there for you. Please call me, okay? Um, I will be available, but the office just won't be open during that time, okay? Anything else? All right. In your prayer or in your uh, bulletin is also the prayer list for this week. Please join us in praying for those people throughout the week. Put that in a place where you will find it easily this week so you can be praying alongside us. We covet your prayers for those people and we thank you for joining us in prayer throughout the last week. Um, will you join me in a general word of prayer this morning? Well, Father, we are so glad to be gathered together this morning. As the people of God, we were so thankful and we rejoiced when we heard the brethren come to us and say, come, let us go and gather together in the house of the Lord. This is the place for us to be, Father. This is the only place for us to be, gathered together with you and with our brothers and sisters. And so we begin this morning by giving you thanks that we have this place, that we have these people, that we have this family, that you have seen fit to draw us together, to knit us together, especially, Father, in a world that is so torn apart, in a world that is ravaged by things like hate, and discord that you saw fit to bring us together. Father, we are so thankful that you have worked so mightily in our lives. And Father, we give you thanks for the many blessings that you have seen fit to give to us. Today, even, you woke us up, you gave us the breath of life, you helped us to arrive here safely. You have fed us. You have nourished us. And Father, beyond just this day, you have given to us each and every day consistently because you are a good, good Father and you love us. And Father, we give you thanks for the gift of Jesus Christ, your Son, without whom we would have no reason to celebrate any season, let alone the season of Christmas. And Father, that reminds us, we lay before you all of the plans for our Christmas season, especially the plans for our service this evening. Lord, we intend for this to be a community service. We intend for this to be an opportunity to reach deep into our communities, into the communities of Bloomingdale and Roselle and Glendale Heights and Addison and Hanover Park and beyond. And so, Father, we ask that you would begin even now, sending to us folks that we don't yet know. And, Father, that you would begin preparing us as your church to receive them well. Father, that we would share with them the name of Jesus clearly and boldly. That those who come tonight would leave here having heard the good news of the gift of the babe of Bethlehem, Jesus our Savior. And Father, we lift to you again all those on our prayer list, those who are sick, those who are injured, those who are having surgery, those who are recovering from surgery. Father, those who may be grieving the loss of a loved one. Father, we lift to you those requests that we have named before you and those that we only name in our hearts. Father, you know them 
before we even speak them. Lord, your word tells us that if your people will humble themselves and kneel before you, you will hear them. You will come down from heaven and you will work for the good of them. And so, Lord, we ask for this. We ask that you will hear us and that you will work for each and every single one of these. And Father, now as we turn our hearts to your word this morning, we ask once again for the wisdom and the discernment, the movement of your Holy Spirit in this place, that as we hear this word, it would fall fresh on our hearts and on our minds and in our lives. We ask all this in the precious name of Jesus, the babe of Bethlehem, our Savior. Amen.
Well, brothers and sisters, as we come to hear the word of God this morning, I would ask that as you are able, you would stand for the reading of God's word, that as we hear God's word, it would fall fresh on us. This morning, we continue our look at the glory of the Lord. This morning, hearing from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, beginning at verse 1. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word for this day. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up and every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level and the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, brothers and sisters, the prophet Isaiah... The prophet Isaiah was a man well before his time. As a matter of fact, he was a man about 150 years before his time. Or at least he was a man speaking about 150 years before his time and what he was speaking would actually come into existence Let me see if I can help to set the scene for you. It was sometime around the year 700 BC. Isaiah is receiving word after word from the Lord God. And in turn, he is preaching that word, prophesying that word to the people of God. Much of that word is doom and gloom. Much of what Isaiah is given to say to God's people is about warfare and suffering and exile. Just like the words that God had given to prophets like Ezekiel and Jeremiah. But in Isaiah's case, unlike Jeremiah's case, for instance, in Isaiah's case, his words were spoken some 150 years before they would actually unfold. In other words, Isaiah proclaimed terror, terror that would come out of the north for Israel, but that terror was a day that was over a century and a half away. So too, Isaiah's words of comfort that we hear today. For Israel, when when Isaiah proclaimed this, this comfort, he was speaking about a comfort that they would one day know after they had been captured by Nebuchadnezzar, this king of Babylon who came out of the north, after they had been in exile for 70 years, after the Lord's anger had subsided against them, and after he had finally let them come back home to Jerusalem. In about 150 years plus 70 years, so 210, 220 years. But these words, just like every other word of Scripture, they weren't just given for the people of Israel. They weren't just meant to speak comfort only to those people who would someday come home from the Babylonian exile. These words were intended to speak to our lives too, to you and me. 
Isaiah has a word of comfort for you and for me this morning. But what is that word of comfort for us? And more importantly, do we have to wait 150 years or 220 years for it? Some of you are looking at me this morning going, I sure hope not. Here in the 40th chapter of Isaiah, we hear what have become very famous words. Comfort ye my people, thus saith your God. If you have spent any time at all around the church, especially, by the way, if you have spent any time at all around what we call confessional churches, Lutheran churches, Methodist churches, Presbyterian churches, uh, Catholic churches, perhaps even, you have certainly heard this verse of scripture before. Comfort, comfort ye my people, thus saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem that her warfare has been accomplished or as Handel said, accomplished, right? And her iniquity is pardoned. If those words sound incredibly familiar, it's not likely just because you've been around the church or just because you've heard Isaiah 40 preached time and time again. It's also because those words have become famous thanks once again to George Friedrich Handel and the Messiah. The second movement of the Messiah is a tenor recitative that is simply titled, Comfort Ye. And it is, as I have stated before, word for word, the text of Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 4 that we have just read. But I want you to hear it how Handel heard it. So let's listen quickly this morning to Comfort Ye. Well, okay, let's skip that. <laughs> Me sing it? <laughs> uh, I can't. Maybe another time. How about that? <laughs> um, well, hmm. S- what's that? Uh, no, that's okay. So it's a beautiful tenor recitative. Go and look it up when you get home today. Um, and um, it's, it's the exact same text that we just heard a moment ago. Um, what, is, what is the comfort that Isaiah is proclaiming to you and me today? The simple answer to that question, of course, is that he is proclaiming the comfort of Jesus. When Isaiah pronounced comfort, to Israel, he repeated himself purposely, right? He said, comfort, comfort ye. He said, comfort twice. He did that to put a strong emphasis on the word. What was coming for the people one day was more than just an end to suffering. It was more than just an end to bloodshed and warfare that they had become so accustomed to. The comfort that the people would one day know was what was indeed called the tenderness of God. The tenderness of God himself, the the grace and mercy of God, all wrapped up, by the way, in a neat little package that Isaiah called comfort. Comfort. But the angel later named that package Jesus. Isaiah's comfort is our comfort too. And the beauty of Isaiah's message is as beautiful today for us as it was for the people of Israel some 2,500 years ago. The most beautiful news Isaiah has to offer his people is this. God's judgment for their sin which was that exile, King Nebuchadnezzar coming out of the north, taking them into Babylon, God's judgment for their sin will not last forever. 
What is absolutely most incredible to me is that when it comes to the matter of the comfort that Isaiah is speaking about here in chapter 40, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter whether we are talking about ancient Israel or modern day Bloomingdale. The comfort that Isaiah is proclaiming is ultimately the same promise. One day, God is going to bring you home. One day, God's going to bring you home. For Israel, that promise meant that one day he would gather them up from the nation of Babylon, from the oppression of King Nebuchadnezzar, and bring them back home to Jerusalem. And they would once again flourish and, and thrive as his people. For you and I, for God's church in Jesus Christ, that promise is practically the same. He has promised us that one day he will bring us home with him. Now, he might not bring us necessarily to Jerusalem proper, but as we talked about last week, he's getting ready to bring us to the new Jerusalem, our happy home, where everything is finally at rest and peace. And on that day, when Jesus comes with the glory of the Lord, he will call us home with him, and then the judgment of our sin, the exile that we have been forced to walk in this world, which is not our home, will finally be over. Our comfort will finally have come. We will finally know the tenderness of our God. And it will all be because God promised that he will not let his anger linger against us forever. He will not remain furious with us forever. His judgment of our sin will not last forever. Peace will come. Comfort is on the way. And that comfort has a name. Jesus. Jesus Christ, the Savior of all mankind. So this morning, I want to dig just a little deeper into Isaiah's words. In chapter 40, and I think we're going to find three incredible ways that Isaiah records that God has revealed his glory to us in Jesus Christ. Three incredible ways God revealed his glory to us in Jesus Christ. The first one is this. Jesus came to us as a comfort to God's people. Jesus is a comfort to God's people. You have to wonder how Isaiah must have been feeling by the time that God finally gave him a word of prophecy about comfort, the comfort that he had in store for his people. Up until this time, God's words had been nothing about, nothing except for words of war. By the way, here's some of the things that uh, Israel had to hear from Isaiah, words of criticism Every movement that the people of Israel made, Isaiah was sent to criticize. There were words like this from Isaiah 34 and 2. The Lord is angry with all nations. His wrath is on all their armies. He will totally destroy them. He will give them over to slaughter. Now, I'm going to go off script for just a second, but could you imagine having to go to church on Sunday morning and listen to the preacher say, um, God's going to give you all over to slaughter. Anybody want to come back next week? Not exactly the place that I would want to be as the mouthpiece of God. But then... God gives Isaiah this word about comfort. And Isaiah goes, this is really something different. This is really something good. This was something that the people really wanted to rally around and they wanted to hear. And as well they should because wrapped up inside of that word comfort is a complex web of God's unceasing love. The biblical theology study Bible defines this word comfort in a particular way. It says it is the full retribution for Israel's sin that has been paid out and no more punishment will be forthcoming. 
coming. No more punishment will be forthcoming. Did you know that the dictionary defines the word retribution as punishment inflicted on someone as payment for a wrong or a criminal act? In other words, this comfort that Isaiah has proclaimed to the people was after all of your time in exile, all of your sins are going to be accounted for. Your debt to God will be paid for in full. All that weight that you feel from all of the sin that has been stacked up against you, it'll be gone. And God will then deliver you back to your home, to your promised land, flowing with milk and honey, where you may dwell securely. Now, brothers and sisters, if you can't easily make the connection, draw your own conclusion to see that that has to be a symbol, that uh, it has to be a symbol, it has to be an example of exactly how... That was the word to Israel, but that is also the word to us in Jesus. Then as your pastor, I must have failed you. In the same way that Isaiah proclaimed this comfort to his people, brothers and sisters, we have to hear Isaiah proclaim that comfort to us. There is a day coming when King Jesus... The very same Jesus, by the way, who was once the infant king in that Bethlehem manger will come for you. And on that day, he will speak the same word, the very same word that Isaiah spoke to the people. Comfort. Comfort, my people. And that comfort word will mean the same thing. It will be full retribution. Your sin has been paid out. No more punishment Your debt to God is paid in full in me, Jesus Christ, your Lord. The weight of that sin that was stacked up against you is now gone. You are now free. Christ, me, I have come to call you home to the promised land with me so we can dwell securely forever. Now, it's at this point that some of you are probably thinking, You know, Pastor, um, it is the Sunday before Christmas, and this doesn't sound a lot like an Advent message to me. If anything, it sounds like maybe an Easter message or maybe a Revival Sunday message. And I would say, sure, okay, great, but let's consider this. How do we, the New Testament church, ever experience the comfort that Jesus proclaims if there wasn't first a manger? What if there never was a baby in Bethlehem? Then how do we get to the comfort? You see, Christmas brings us tidings of comfort and joy. We don't get those tidings of comfort and joy without a way in a manger. The second revelation of God's glory from Isaiah today is this. Jesus came to bring completion to the hard service of God's people. Jesus came to bring completion to the hard service of God's people. I want to talk for a moment about that hard service word, the hard service of Israel and exactly what that phrase means. Look again at verse 2 of our text. In the New International Version of the Bible, it says it this way. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. If we were to read this in what's called the RSV or the Revised Standard Version, which many of you probably grew up with, it says, speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. Hard service or warfare. In the NIV, we see that Israel has been suffering the hard service. The RSV, their punishment is described as warfare. 
Whatever it was that Israel was suffering, both translations consider it to be double from the Lord's hand the cost of their sins. In order to make sense of what Isaiah means double for her sins, let's just say for the sake of argument that the sins that Israel has racked up measured in a cost, okay? So we could say, what did Israel's sins cost? Now let's also say, just for the sake of this example, that the cost of Israel's sins were $1,000. Yes, I understand that's ludicrous to think, but let's just, I have to use simple math, okay? (laughs) So if Isaiah is suggesting that Israel received punishment totaling double all of her sins, then we could assume that what he is saying is that instead of paying back $1,000, they paid back $2,000. Now, I know it seems arbitrary when we're talking about something like sin, the sin of an entire nation of people, but there's a reason for doing this. Culturally speaking, in this language, the idea of having double their sins paid for was very important to Israel, and here's why. In Isaiah's day, if a man stole an ox, a sheep, a donkey, a pig, or specifically a wooden boat, okay? If any of those things belonged to God or a king, the man had to pay it back 30 times. So if he stole one goat, he had to pay it back with 30 goats. If he stole one wooden boat, he had to pay back 30 wooden boats. Now, if he stole one of those things and it belonged to a random poor person, he only had to pay it back 10 times. So when Isaiah suggests that God is satisfied by Israel paying back double, Israel got off pretty easy, didn't they? But wasn't that kind of God's entire point in Jesus Christ? In fact, isn't that God's entire point in Jesus Christ to make the burden that his people bear in Jesus easier? A moment ago when I said, let's say, for example, that Israel's cost was $1,000 and it seems ludicrous to even suggest, first of all, how could a monetary number be placed on something like sin? And secondly, how could the number be so low? But do you know what else seems equally ludicrous to me? That God would give up his one and only son, send him to earth as an infant child, all for the express purpose that that child would grow up and die for the sins of a person like me. That is ludicrous. That is unbelievable. But that is true. And that is true for you, too. Jesus came to earth to bring completion to the hard service of all of God's people. He came to bring an end to our suffering. He came to pay the debt of your sin. As crazy as that might seem. When we accept him as Lord and Savior, when we trust him fully and only. We are the ones who get off easy. He's the one who takes the terrible burden. He's the one who gets the hard service and the warfare. He's the one who completes it. The third revelation of God's glory in Jesus. Jesus came to level the playing field for God's people. Look one last time at verses three and four of our text for today. It says, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up and every mountain and hill be made low and the rough ground shall become level and the rugged places a plain. I want to make sure you don't 
misunderstand me when I say that Jesus came to level the playing field for God's people. I am not talking here about opportunities, for example, in the workplace or social successes. I am not talking about earthly treasures or worldly wealths. Instead, what I mean here is that Jesus came to level the playing field in this simple way. Consider the terrain that Isaiah speaks of in this text. Deserts, valleys, mountains, hills, and rough ground. Deserts, they are filled with sand, scorching sun, wild animals, and the lack of water which threatens life, right? Valleys, they certainly could be a blessing. They could be lush and green, filled with vegetation, but they could also be prone to flooding. They could be ultimately something uh, that could be... um, In order to get through the valley, you have to travel downward from a higher elevation, which could be difficult if you have, for example, an oxen and a cart. Mountains, they're rocky, they're treacherous, they're difficult to climb and traverse. In fact, the higher up one goes, it's harder to breathe as oxygen becomes lighter and lighter, lighter, right? Those who have gone to the Rocky Mountains. Hills, similar to mountains with somewhat less intimidating features. Growing up in the one part of Illinois not touched by the glaciers, and we have some visitors who are here from the part of Wisconsin that was not touched by the glaciers. Rolling hills are wonderful, except for one thing. The top of the hill is a blind spot. You have no idea what's coming over that hill when you're going over it. As you crest the top of that hill, it's almost impossible to see what is coming over the other side. Rough ground obviously is the exact opposite of smooth ground. It could be filled with holes or thorns or thickets. In Illinois, it's probably potholes. (laughs) Regardless of what these land formations are, which ones we're talking about, in one way or another, they each present their own unique form of an obstacle. But Isaiah's word of prophecy was clear. When the Lord comes, let every man prepare such a way for him that there would be no obstacles. Literally nothing would stand in the way of his coming. When we think of Jesus and his birth in Bethlehem, God certainly moved some obstacles out of the way in order for that to happen, didn't he? I mean, he needed Jesus to be born in Bethlehem, but Joseph was in Nazareth. Mary was in Nazareth. So, a census. Obstacle removed. He needed Jesus to be born without sin, but the very act of being born Naturally, by the process of a woman, means being born into sin. So how in the world does this happen? No problem. We'll have a virgin birth. Obstacle removed. He needed Jesus to be the image of humility and gentleness. No problem. We'll just make sure that all the inns were filled up, and we will lay the Savior of the world in a cattle trough. Obstacle removed. And did you know God is still removing obstacles today? God is constantly moving mountains, lowering hills, raising up valleys, and smoothing out the rough spots, all so that there might never ever be an obstacle that keeps anyone, including you, from Him. Ever. Listen, brothers and sisters, we might be the one putting up the obstacles. We might be the ones erecting the walls and shutting the doors and running to the tops of the mountains and hiding down in the lowest of the valleys, but God is doing everything in his power to knock down those walls, to lift us up out of those valleys. And he is doing it Because Jesus always has been his plan for our comfort and joy. Jesus has always been his plan for our comfort, our joy, his full tenderness on display, 
and the completion of all of our long suffering and hard service. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks for the comfort of Jesus. Father, we do so desperately long for the day when we will hear you say, comfort. Comfort my people. We so long for the day when you will speak tenderly to us that our warfare, our hard service is over. In the days that lie between now and that day, Father, we are at war. We are at war with sin. We are at war with Satan, the evil one. We are at war with this world. So many days we are at war with ourselves. Which means, Father, we need you desperately each and every single day. Less of us and more of you. John 3 and 30. Every single day, we must become less and you must become greater. If we have any hope, Father, of your comfort, if we have any hope of knowing your tenderness in whatever fashion we may know it on this side of heaven, we must become less and you must become greater. So Father, help us as we fight this war. Help us in our long suffering, in our hard service every single day, we pray. By the power of your Holy Spirit, fill us and help us as we wait for that day when we will hear comfort. Comfort, my people. Lord, thank you for the babe of Bethlehem without whom that comfort is not possible. We give you this in his name. Amen. Will you please stand?
Well, brothers and sisters, the king is coming one day. Amen? Amen. And the word that he has for you when he comes is comfort. Comfort, my people, thus saith your God. He will speak tenderly to you on that day. And the only thing that he asks of you, the only thing he requires of you, the only thing he wants from you is your heart. Your full trust of him. I know that sounds like a lot. I know it sounds like maybe sometimes more than you're willing to give. But all he asks is that you trust him completely and fully. So as you go out those doors today, there is a difficult world on the other side of those doors. Satan is out there, and there's a world waiting to eat you alive. So I encourage you to go with a God who is ready to say, comfort, comfort. And speak tenderly to you. Go with the love of God, our Father, the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, and with the power, the presence, and the strength of the Holy Spirit every single day. Amen? Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him. Have a wonderful afternoon. Hopefully we'll see you all tonight at 7 o'clock.